Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Unscripted and Unchained RPG Review. I am DM Bloodworth and as you can see by the graphics, uh, today's video I'm making my return to uh, my video series for uh, first look at Advanced Dungeons and Dragons 2nd Edition. Still working on the DM's Guide. Uh, this is about the fourth uh, video just on the DM's Guide. And uh, today I'm going to take a look at Chapter 10, which I have actually mislabeled on the graphic, uh, you know, the picture, uh, chapter 10 as just treasure, but it's actually treasure and magic items. To be honest with you, originally I was just going to either skip over completely or gloss over this whole chapter as far as making a video on it, but it was requested and, you know, I really thought it was going to be Encounters, which is actually chapter 11, uh, but when I noticed that it was chapter 10 treasure I was like well why would why would the person ask me to take a look you know at this in, in closer detail and then I realized uh, as I started looking at it that there is a that there is a very important philosophy of treasure in advanced Dungeons and Dragons uh, and in earlier versions of, uh, of Dungeons and Dragons as well in earlier editions and versions of Dungeons and Dragons where in many cases the amount of treasure that your characters receive is going to translate into probably the, the bulk of their experience point values. Um, but also there's different philosophies on how to handle treasure that will greatly impact the tone and the, uh, and the playability of your campaign as a dungeon master and so treasure is something that you actually have to be mindful of how much or how little you're giving out to your your player characters uh, through their actions uh, it's something that you have to be mindful about when you're giving magic items out there and then are you going to directly translate receiving that magic item to gained experience as well because I've seen where that could become a really crazy amount of XP just by giving a, uh, a low level character a plus one dagger um, because they, they tend to have a really high uh, gold piece value and uh, it doesn't come into later editions and possibly this edition I, I have to take a look at it I'm doing my walkthrough um and first look uh where they they have a different gold value uh as opposed to xp value for items so um so without further ado let's get, jump right into it and start taking a look at chapter 10 treasures and magical items for second edition advanced dungeons and dragons So here we go, uh, page 113 of 258, chapter 10, Treasure and Magical Items. Characters in role-playing games strive for many things, fame, glory, experience among them. But for those who are not fully satisfied with such intangible rewards, there is one other goal, fortune. Strands of glittering golden chains, sacks of silver coin, heaps of marten fur, Bejeweled crowns, enameled scepters, silken cloth, cloths, um, the powerful magic items all await to be discovered or wrestled from the grasp of powerful monsters. With such treasures awaiting, how could any bold adventurer be content to remain peacefully at home? Who needs money treasure is more than just the goal of a or or a measure of material wealth however it takes money to get money so the old saying goes and for adventurers one could even say it takes money to stay alive as characters survive and succeed their challenges become greater and more deadly at first level a simple suit of studded armor a stout pair of boots and a few simple spells were all that the character needed. A high, at higher levels, such simple implements no longer suffice. 
Faced with terrible foes, characters quickly discover that they need strong armors, barded horses, a variety of weapons, fortifications, mended arms, potions, scrolls, and potent magic items. These are the kinds of things that characters have to find, make, or buy, and however they go about acquiring them, they're going to need money. In a sense, then, treasure is also the method of measuring a character's power. Even a low-level character with money and magic to spare is more than a match for an impoverished fellow of higher level. Thus, getting rich and getting ahead are rewards and of themselves, in and of themselves. Forms of treasure. There are many different kinds of treasure. Some of these are obvious, their appropriate value known to all. Others are less easy to spot, their value more difficult to determine. The simplest treasures are items of set value, gold, silver, platinum, and copper coins. Virtually anyone can tell the worth of these. Those with a trained eye can assess the value of semi-precious and precious stones, both cut and uncut. A trained jeweler, goldsmith, or silversmith can appraise a man's work in precious metals, plateware, necklaces, brooches, tiaras, bracelets, rings, and other pieces of jewelry. Tradesmen can evaluate the handiwork of their craft, be it enamel, enamelware, blown glass, statuary, or delicate embroidery, and so on. They, they go through on and on and, and talk about the monetary value of, uh, of many of these more common items. Placement of treasure, one given in, a, one given in the AD&D game is that there is a significant amount of treasure, monetary and magical, that is not circulated in the society. These treasures are not used to purchase goods or pay for services. They do not collect interest in banks, a foreign concept to the age anyway. They do not represent collateral used to secure loans or maintain prestige. They are not the underpinnings of monetary system. They are just piles of unused treasure, apparently forgotten, their potential unrealized. By normal standards, this is an illogical situation. So just why is it there? Why is there so much treasure laying around? Now, it is not important to create a detailed background that goes into the economic theories of dragon hoarding or the supply and demand trade structures of dwarves, but it does hurt, doesn't hurt to look at some of the basic premises behind all of this loose treasure. Take these three related premises. Premise number one. Long ago, the world was a wealthier place since all money has been taken out of circulation. Once the world was more culturally advanced, since only an organized society can control things like mine, uh, minting or a on a large scale. Or the third premise, the world has fallen into a dark age since now these same hordes are eagerly sought after by adventurers and there are few governments able to mint such amounts of coinage. From these premises, premises the DM begins to create a background for his campaign world. Here are some possibilities. present time, there was a golden age of learning and culture. It could have been the reign of the elven lords, the empire of the dwarves, the great age of peace, the time before the coming of man, or the rule of a good king, uh, Haring. Then came a great disaster, an evil time. Suddenly the dragon fire began and the sinking of the Growing mountains occurred, a darkening, a darkling invaded man arrived, or uh, Therop, usurper King Haring's throne. Okay, so they, they go into talking about, you know, what is the, what is the, the reason behind 
these large hordes of, uh, of gold and, and platinum or magic items and such. And, and so they're giving you basic scenarios of, of how you can explain that away if the players at your table even bother to ask. Um, so that was the one thing that I you know find that's a little bit interesting about this section. Uh, that I went to picked up on if I, I didn't just move along because I, I never really sat there and pondered these issues uh, as a player. You know, I, I just cared about, you know, I'm, I'm doing a, an adventure. I expect to get paid in gold for, you know, a certain amount based on the level and, um, and the risk being taken. You know, anywhere from several hundred gold pieces to a few thousand gold pieces. And if, if there was a magic item found along the way, all the better. And, and you know, this was a really productive adventure. Um, not thinking really about whether, you know, how does this impact the economy overall by me bringing home a thousand gold pieces. So uh, as a DM looking at these, I would probably go with... Um, you know, there's just a, a, a slightly different monetary system taking place where the um, the standard is not like a gold or a silver standard, but probably closer to a copper standard. And I would adjust some of the uh, some of the expenses of, of these adventure items um, uh, through a variety of methods. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Who's got the treasure? The next question relating to treasure hoards is just who assembled the treasures and to what end? All right, so again, this is going into, you know, what is the rationale for these various creatures that you're encountering to have this treasure? I mean, we, we I don't think that we frequently sit there and we wonder, you know, how come every kobold has three copper pieces in their pouch? Um... You know, what do they spend their money on? What do they, you know, um, we don't go into that kind of detail about it. We're, we're just, you know, scavenging what, uh, what valuables the creatures that we kill while, while we're adventuring. And, uh, and we move along. We don't really ask those questions. But it would certainly be an interesting thing to think about as a DM if you have that extended period of time to kind of flesh out, at least in your own mind, how the economy of your world actually functions. So we will move on. Uh, intelligent creatures. So they're talking about, um, you know, the types of creatures that, you, that would have treasures. Planned and random encounter treasures. It is important for the DM to distinguish between place treasure and those found with random encounters. The scale uh, of two is the scale of the two is vastly different. Treasure tables. Now I might roll on a treasure table, but I am certainly going to make the decision whether or not. Um, that's the actual item that the players have discovered. Um, uh, sometimes I'll change the weapon type because the, um, you know, the, the fighter is a, you know, is a hand axe user for the most part. And every time that I rolled on, uh, you know, on a weapons table for magic items, I've rolled something other than a hand axe, which is probably less rare than, let's say, a long sword. And so I might decide, you know what, it's time that the fighter in the group gets the weapon of his or her, um, you know, favorite use of and, and have that become discovered. So uh, it's, it's kind of fudging the rolls a little bit in order to, yes, make the players a little bit happier. But um, I think if you left it completely randomized, then every fighter is gonna walk around with, uh, you know, sk being skilled up uh, with proficiencies and, and even specialization in a long sword, which is the most common magic item, uh, magic weapon found. 
So maintaining balance, and I, I kind of just relate upon that a little bit. Um, and they start talking about the, the different types of theories. Uh, so you have the, uh, the Too Little Treasure and then the Monty Hall campaign. So let's, talk, uh, let's read a little bit about Too Little Treasure. In this case of the tight-fisted DM, the most obvious signs that the players are not having fun are frustrating cynicism and low expectations. If the characters are not finding treasure commensurate to the risks they took, the players are going to wonder if all the effort of playing is really worth it. They become frustrated when upon solving a devious trap, they discover a pittance or nothing at all. All right, and, and so, yes, you wanna control the amount of treasure that's getting into your player's hands, but you don't want it to be too little. Uh, you want it to match as closely as you can with the, um, the risk that they have taken um, or the reward that uh, generally is something that they're deserving of. And so, um, and so you're going to not just leave it to random. Uh, you are going to create you know, amounts that are going to match what their, uh, what their challenge was. The Monty Hall campaigns at the other extreme, the problems of too much treasure are not so easily solved. Here players may enjoy the game and why not? Their characters are doing quite well. They have su sufficient money and magic to best any situation the, cam uh, the DM can um, devise. However, the DM seldom has the same enjoyment. He is faced with the task of topping the last lucrative adventure. He must make each adventure a greater challenge than the last. While this is true for all DMs, it is grossly exaggerating, uh, exaggerated for DMs who give out too much. How do you stop the adventure where the fighter got a hammer of Thor or some equally valuable item. Yeah, it's it's pretty tough uh, for you to tone things down once you've loaded them up with a whole slew of really powerful magical items. Then we go into magical items themselves. So one of the most important types uh, important types of treasure a character can earn is a magical item. Not only does the item act as an immediate reward for good play, it increases the power and survivability of the character. Such items add to the wonder and romance of the game, allowing the character to perform feats far beyond those of ordinary mortals. Rare indeed is the player character who does not want the rewards of magic items. All right, and we go into, and, and magic items will range, generally speaking, anywhere from a plus one, uh, no special ability uh, kind of a magic item, to, um, you know, plus four, even, I believe, plus five is possible, plus special effects, and so on. Magic items are, um, they talk about now uh, buying magic items, so should it be possible to buy magic items right off the, the rack? Generally speaking, no. Uh, generally speaking, these are items that have to, uh, that have to be requisitioned and they take, uh, they take weeks if not months to fabricate. They require not only the best craftsmanship, but also uh, the magic and the enchanter uh, willing to do the work and so on. So, um, and they, they become incredibly expensive uh, when you are custom crafting uh, a magic item uh, specifically for your use. Rare or common. Um, once again, I, I think, you know, magic items in, in most worlds should be fairly rare. It certainly shouldn't be common. Uh, it should be fairly rare. And there's ways to work around, um, there's ways to work around 
uh, creatures that can only be hit by magic items. Uh, you can easily change that, and I will talk about uh, that as well. So here we get into researching uh, magical items. So in creating new magic items, whether it be uh, you know brewing potions or or creating scrolls and such, uh, to actually crafting magical weapons or armor. <clears throat> the nature of magical fabrication. There needs to be a method of fabricating it. There needs to be fan uh, a fantastical approach takes. A drastically different view of magic item construction. Here, when the player says, I want to create a rope of climbing, the DM provides a list of impossible ingredients. It then becomes the player's obligation to obtain these materials or means to collect the ingredients and such. And so they have to go on adventures to collect the items that they do need in order to create the magic item that they desire. Combining the practical with the fantastical and you basically end up with a, a full-fledged system. The practical was says the magic item is manufactured is somehow tied to a common sense. The materials needed to make them reflect the properties of the item being constructed and the steps required fairly well defined. So you can kind of just buy them fairly easily without having to adventure to get those, uh, those components. And so they suggest combining the two. Scrolls and potions, a little bit easier to fabricate scrolls uh, than to fabricate, um, you know, magic items, um, magic weapons, let's say. And they talk about here, you need a quill, you need paper. Paper needs to have, uh, you know, different qualities of the paper. You need ink. You can get, as a DM, you can get kind of crazy with some of this stuff and require special types of ink, um, uh, which they're talking about here, where they talk about the ingredients could be simple as ink from a giant squid mixed with the venom of a wyvern sting, you know, or, well, those are actually not common, common. those are uh, exotic ingredients. But um, yeah, you, you can make that um, a little bit more challenging by requiring uh, that the inks or the quills come from special uh, and rarer uh, sources. Potion's going to be very much the same thing. This here section of the chapter talks about creating potions, whether it's by wizards or priests. Talk about how priests don't use laboratories. Such equipment smacks of impious and heretical uh, learning instead, basically science. So they would be counter to science, whereas a wizard would use a laboratory. Finding the right materials, so still talking about materials. Enchanting items, which was one of the steps I mentioned, would also have to come into play. So it's not just a matter of collecting all of the materials that you might need uh, and going possibly going on adventures to get those materials, but you also have to then uh, have a, a very high quality item crafted and then bring it to someone uh, to enchant it. Recharging magic items, destroying magic items. So, so there might be some, uh, you know, some requirements, uh, spe special uh, process in order to destroy a magic items. I.e. the one ring of uh, power in Lord of the Rings. Artifacts and relics as optional rules. These are obviously very unique items that uh, there might only be one in the entire world and they are usually extremely powerful. Um, if, if you have players that, that come into possession of artifacts, just remember that artifacts tend to find a way to 
get out of their hands and into somebody else's hands, uh, whether you know fairly soon or you know many many years later. But still, um, it's 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 a good thing as a DM to have players in possession of artifacts for a brief period of time, perhaps even just a necessity for one adventure. And then um, by some means, they no longer have access to the artifact. Perhaps the artifact was loaned to them uh, upon pain of death if they don't return it. And then, uh, you know, and then once they've, they've done their quest, they return the item uh, or they, you know, they try to skip out of town with the item and that could certainly lead to um, other negative consequences down the road. Uh, but it, it certainly might become an interesting uh, thing to include in your uh, campaign as side quests, developing some powerful enemies that they will have to answer to down the road. He's still talking about artifacts here and some of the dangers involved with having artifacts. More specifics. All right, so uh, I'm going to switch views here. One of the things that I do if I want to uh, limit the number of magic items out in the world but still give uh, player characters the ability to, um, to combat fairly low-level creatures that still require a, uh, a, plus, a plus one item to hit them, uh, is that that plus one doesn't have to be the result of, a, uh, the result of magic. It could also be the result of a quality manufacture and uh or material that will give the um give that possibility so you could very easily say well a sword that is made um almost entirely out of silver even though i don't think that you know um metal wise that's probably the best thing because silver is probably a softer um metal it still needs a an iron core uh, or or even a steel core to it but, um, but anyway, um, you can say that the silver, you know, the silver in the sword is uh, going to give it the equivalent of a plus one so that it can be used against creatures that can only be hit by a plus one weapon or only hurt by a plus one weapon. Um, obviously, lycanthropes are, are harmed by silver, you know, naturally to begin with. Um, so you can do it that way and make uh, certain materials confer upon the, uh, the weapon that plus one or plus two modifier without actually changing the modifier. So it's giving it the equivalent of without actually making it more deadly. So you're not going to add that plus two to hit and damage, let's say, but you're going to say that it can hit a creature requiring a plus two if you chose to or you could you could do both and have it where it not only confers the plus two ability to hit but um but it actually changed the modifiers of your attack rolls and your damage as well so um so material can play a role in doing that without having to make it magical uh the other thing is craftsmanship so you can have levels of craftsmanship and this is another way that you can adjust those um, those price charts that you have for fairly common, um, you know, common uh, armor and, and such, where if you wanted to uh, get your players into, let's say, chainmail armor, and they don't have the, you know, the 50 gold that it might take to get into a suit of chainmail armor. I'm just throwing that off the top of my head without looking at it. Uh, you could say, well, there's there's one that's only 25 gold but it is uh it is a lower quality 
and so it might damage a little bit easier. Might have one less um, one less armor class uh, benefit to it than uh, than a standard suit of chainmail armor. Uh, or you can go the other direction, obviously, and you can say that you know, well, this chainmail armor is of higher crafted ability, and so it's going to give you, uh, even though it's still chainmail, it's going to be more expensive. It's going to look more expensive. Uh, and um, and you might get some benefits. Usually I wouldn't change the armor class, um, making it Im improved, but I might lighten it, all right? So by using different, uh, different metals in it, uh, you've increased its value, uh, but you've also reduced its, its uh, weight uh, in, in that instance. And so uh, you're not quite going to mithril steel, but you're somewhere in between there. So the quality of the armor is uh, making it a little bit lighter, uh, possibly easier to put on or, or take, you know, take on or put on, blah, put on or take off and, and so on. So you can modify, um, you can modify the, the world's economy uh, just by introducing various uh, qualities of things. And that's what allows you to really change the whole coin economy that's out there in the world. Uh, if you assume that the average person is not even using standard quality equipment, they're using uh, either slightly below or even poor quality equipment, and then they're more willing to, when it breaks, just to easily replace it. And so you can have a sword that only costs a few copper pieces because it was used on the battlefield. It's kind of old and dinged up or you know, even blunt and, and need some repair work. And so that's why you got it for so much cheaper, uh, as opposed to if there, you don't have access to magic items, but you do want something that is, that is a little bit more, um, more noticeable, um, you know, for just your own prestige, or you want something that's going to uh, be lightened up. So a different alloy uh, or a different type of metal being used in the same thing in order to jack up both the price and uh, and give you some benefits uh, if you don't have access to a true magic item as well. So um, obviously this is just a, a real brief run through of it and, and you can see how, uh, and it's not that many pages, it's probably only about 25 pages of, of actual um, rules and content for treasures and magic items but you can certainly see the way that you can uh, impact your um, your campaign, your your adventure world, um, and its economy by taking a, a really good look at this treasure and magic item section, and and really deciding for yourself like how am I going to explain or use um, a coin system, and uh, how am I going to handle treasure coming into uh, the player character's hands. Uh, what are they going to do with it? Where do they put it when they're amassing so much? Uh, which is something that doesn't often come up uh, as to, you know, wh where do they store all of these riches uh, that they do gain? Like, uh, do they put it in, you know, into a bank? And then as they're adventuring and going beyond that, if the character gets killed, what happens to their bank account? How does that get handled out, um, you know, amongst the rest of the party and such. So uh, you can go very, very detailed or uh, you can go, you know, not detailed at all and just not even think about it, not worry about it, not go into that level of, uh, of concern about uh, the overall coin economy or where does this stuff really come from? Uh, why does this orc, you know, why does every orc I encounter carry three, uh, three silver pieces in their pocket as opposed to, you know, every, uh, every kobold only has two copper pieces. Uh, you don't have to get involved at, at that level of, uh, of concern with it. So once again, I hope you enjoyed this, uh, you know, video and uh, please leave your comments in there. If there's anything that I kind of glossed over that you want me to more specifically take a look at, uh, I will save that for an addendum video uh, where I kind of 
do an overview of everything that I've looked at in the uh, in the Dungeon Master's Guide. The next video in this series is definitely going to be Chapter 11, which is Encounters. I will spend a lot more time with that and uh, and go into much more detail because that really does come down to as a DM uh, setting up the circumstances for your uh, for your player party uh, to really engage in the world that you're creating and to you know the encounter is the basis for what they're doing and they might have multiple encounters during an adventure so I will spend a good deal of time on that I am certainly going to read it ahead of time and get a real good sense of it just like I did with the combat system where I I really dug a little bit deeper into it so it's not going to be a first look it's going to be a, uh, a flip through and, and an overview of the encounter system for second edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. So once again, thanks for joining. I hope you liked this video. Please give it a thumbs up if you did. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comments section. If you hadn't subscribed, please consider subscribing. And uh, I look forward to seeing you on the gaming screen sometime soon. I know I've been saying it that I'm looking forward to uh, doing some one shots, either using second edition, the true second edition, or using the uh, or using uh, for Golden Glory, which is the OSR version, uh, the the um, more concise version of second edition as well. So uh, one of those two was coming along the lines, uh, and I should have an adventure, a one shot set up for that probably within the next. Uh, two weeks, I'll say, just to give myself some uh, some cushion time. And I'll talk about that project uh, later on. I'm already starting to collect a few players that are really interested in doing it. So I do look forward to seeing you on the gaming screen sometime soon, within the next week or two, specifically for running something with uh, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition. Thanks for joining. Take care.